changes people's lives. God's Word changes lives. And these guys spent a, uh, a weekend with us with no phones, and uh, they became servants. And we told them before they left that if you want to first to follow Jesus, you have to be a servant to all. And we're, we're all called to be servants. Um, and uh, a little bit of uh, today's message today um, was uh, in Genesis 40 where we're picking up. We've been going through the book of Genesis, and I mean, it has been uh, some 40 chapters, some 45, 50 plus weeks that we've been in Genesis, and I mean, it's been quite a journey. And I'm thankful for uh, the opportunity uh, to be able to present this to you, to learn with you as we go through these books of the Bible. Uh, and there's a lot in there. I'm going to make sure we don't miss anything, but. There is so much to go over in here. Uh, last week we covered Genesis 39. We followed the life of Joseph after he was sold into slavery. Uh, and I can't imagine how Joseph must feel after being hated so much by his brothers, so much that they wanted him dead. His brothers hated him so much that they wanted him dead. And this would have had to be in a dark, dark time in, in Joseph's life, a difficult time. And then he, he was bought again as a slave. Or he was, he was bought by... by uh, First sold to Arab traders, and then he was sold to Potiphar, uh, only to be a slave in his household. So um, this would uh, be in this dark time in his life. The Bible says, even though it was a dark time, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him during this time. Uh, and so Joseph prospered. He was a man of good character. He was a great leader. He was responsible. God shined through his character so much that, that Potiphar, the man that bought him, put him in charge of everything that he had. He put him in charge of everything that he had, so much that he, he gave him control of so much stuff that he said, the Bible says that it, he didn't worry about anything other than what was he had to eat, which I think that would be an awesome thing. If all I had to worry about was what I had to eat next, I mean, that would be great. I had no care in the world. Just, what am I going to eat today? It reminds me when I was on a cruise ship you know, many, too many years ago because it's been a long time. But, uh, you know, you get up, you go to the morning, you just worry about what you're going to eat. I mean, everything else is there. You can sit on the balcony, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I, I would love to have, that's all I had to worry about. But just when things were going really good, Potiphar's wife began to lust after Joseph as she tries to hook up with him. So when he refuses, because he knows, even he, he knows he's a, single, he's a single guy, and even as a single guy, he knows what he stands to lose morally if he goes through with this. And it was a temptation for him, I'm sure. But he would, he, it look, appears to him that he probably has no future in his current status, being a servant, being a prisoner. And so, she, uh, later on, she made sure that nobody else was in the house, and she made a pass at Joseph, and grabs him by the rope, and and, uh, and she tries to basically pull him into her arms, and he's like, nope, I'm gone, and she's left with the rope in his hand, he, in her rope, his rope in her hand. I don't, he may have left in his DVDs, I don't know, but he, he took off across there, and uh, he didn't care because he did not want to be caught in that situation. And so he left. And so... Um, he knew better than to be alone with this temptation, and that's where a lot of us fail, because we allow ourselves to be alone with our temptation. And, and so uh, we linger too long and get as close as we can and say, I want to get as close as I can to the fire without getting burned. And so we do that, but not Joseph. He did the right thing. He ran. And he fled from his temptation, as Scripture commands us to, and he took away the way of escape that God promises in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So, then Potiphar's wife has a nerve to try, nerve to try and call the guards, claim that Joseph attacked him, and, and take, try to take advantage of her, knowing that they would take her word over some slave, some Hebrew slave, and he would likely be put to death. And so she wouldn't have to worry about the truth getting out in her eyes, I'm sure. And uh, she even told Potiphar, she said, that Hebrew slave you brought in our house, he attacked me. He tried to sexually harass me. So uh, he, And so he said, look, I have this robe that he left behind. I mean, look, this is proof. I've got his robe right here. He left it right in my hands. And so Potiphar became angry. And uh, But to my surprise, he didn't kill Joseph. He stuck him in prison with the king's prisoners. And, and man, when it rains, it pours. I mean, he just had everything stacked against him, it seems. Things were going his way. He was, in, 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 he was uh, ahead of everything in Potiphar's house. And then right back in prison is where he's at. So while he was in prison, the Bible says the Lord was with him. And because the Lord was with him, he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. 
Uh, I'm sure that uh, Potiphar may have put in a good word to the prison warden, if you know. But so guess what? The warden put Joseph in charge of all those who were held in the prison, and he was responsible for all that was done there. And it says that the warden paid no attention to anything, much like Potiphar when he was in Potiphar's house. The warden didn't pay attention to anything that was under Joseph's care. So that's some trust right there. That's the faithfulness of God working in his life. Joseph may have been going through a deep, dark time in his life, being in prison, but God was showing Joseph that he was right, that he was right there with him in all those times. And, and so, and Joseph stayed true to his character, and God was going to make him as successful as possible, even in prison. And so, there was a plan in all this for Joseph. And so, uh, he was going to come out on the other side of this stronger, better than ever, and he might not could see his future, but guess what? God did. You might not see your future right now, but God sees it. And he's going to see you through it if you're honorable to him, even in the dark phases of your life. So it's important to know that he had no idea of what was to come. He didn't know he's in prison. I mean, he's been a slave. He knew nothing about what was coming in chapter 41 or how God was going to use him. But yet he still chose to be a man of good character and a good leader. Even though he was in prison, even though he was a slave, he still was a man of good character. He didn't throw all the caution to the wind and say, well, my life is just junk right now. I might as well not even try. That's what a lot of us would do. But he did not do that. He trusted God to provide for him. God was all he had, and God was all he needed. So we're going to pick up in Genesis 40, and Joseph's in the king's prison with all the king's prisoners, and let's see what happens in chapter 40 in verses 1 through 4. So it says, Sometime later the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief's cupbearer and the chief baker, put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. So my version in the NIV, which is what I read from the NIV, uh, and I know the King James Version is, you know, is it, but uh, the King James Version refers to him as the butler. Mine says the cupbearer. Uh, and so uh, now when the, we know the cupbearer was typically the one who could be responsible for making sure that the king's drink didn't have anything in it. Sometimes he sampled it first to make sure there wasn't poison in it. Tough job. I mean, if somebody did poison it, you're in trouble. But that, you know, he was the cupbearer or the baker. And so um, he sampled these drinks to make sure they were good. It's possible that this baker cupbearer did just that, among many other things for Pharaoh. But I, I, don't, I, I don't know what they did to make him so angry, but it was evidently bad enough that, that he decided it's best to throw both these guys into prison. So maybe he wanted steak and eggs, and the guy made pasta and gave him water. I, you know, that's that's grounds, you know, for some serious, some serious ramifications there. When you want steak, I mean, I'm a steak guy. Just kidding, y'all. But um, maybe more likely they were suspected of murder or a plot to kill the king. I mean, that's that would be something worthy of going to the king's prison because if they were uh, if they were uh, suspected of, of a plot to kill the king, well then, yeah, definitely, you're going to end up in prison. So uh, so the captain of the guard put Joseph in charge of the butler and the baker. So I can already sense a stirring amongst Joseph and these guys in prison that God is working, and I believe God has Joseph in this position and these two officials of the king of Egypt in this position for a reason. So I told you all last week that I don't believe that Potiphar really believed his wife when she said that Joseph tried to attack her and sexually harass her. I, I don't believe that at all because, uh, one, he probably would have killed her. I, mean, I, I would have reacted pretty harshly if that would have been me and my wife. So uh, I don't think he would have done that. Um, but I honestly believe that God led him to put Joseph in prison uh, instead for the purpose of this very meeting. We don't always see or know how God is going to work in our lives in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of our trials. Uh, verse 3 says that Pharaoh put the baker and the butler in the custody of who? What's that? Joseph. Yeah, but and then, okay, so it put him in, the, in, the, in Joseph's care. And then it also says, uh, chapter 40, that uh, of chapter, I'm sorry. I might get that backwards. Um, yeah, the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. So if you were to go back to uh, chapter 39, it actually refers to as the captain of the guard as who? You know I remember? Potiphar. Potiphar 
offer is the captain of the guard. So if you believe that Joseph sexually harassed your wife, you ain't going to put him in any special role of authority in the prison, I don't think. Potiphar knew that Joseph was a good guy of good character, and he recognized the hand of the Lord in his life, and he elevated his status in prison, and just as he'd done his own house. That's why I believe he probably put a good word in for Joseph with the warden to put him in charge of this stuff. And it says in verse 4 that Joseph served and attended these two men. Even though that Potiphar made sure that he had an elevated status in prison, had a position of high authority, Joseph did not use his authority to boss people around. He didn't throw his weight around and say, you guys are going to do what I say to do. I mean, he, this, he wasn't rude. He wasn't, I mean, this was a good demonstration of having authority for a, a believer. So he used his high position to serve others. He attended them. And that's not the way we often see it. Usually when someone's given a position of authority, a lot of times that person tries to make a name for themselves by, by, by showing that authority. But Joseph had a servant, a servant's heart. And he cared about others. And that showed through this moment. And so maybe what happened to him in his life allowed him to see what others are going through, how they have hurt in their life, and that, see a way to minister to them. And maybe that's, maybe that's why. And so that's why he cared. And that's why God cared. So reverse, we're going to read verse 5 through 9 here. We'll carry on. So it says uh, in the last part of verse 4, after they've been in custody for some time, verse 5 says, Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker, the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. And when Joseph came to the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in the custody with him in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. And so then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream, and he said to him, In my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes, and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. Most people who were accustomed to authority, uh, accustomed to seeing sad faces in prison, all the time. I mean, if you're in prison, you're probably not very happy. So, I mean, this would be something they would typically see. Not exactly a happy place to be. So, it would, you would think that there wouldn't be a big deal. But, especially if they were wrongfully in prison, I'd probably even be more bummed, like Joseph was. But when Joseph walks by these two officials of the king and notices that they're, they're sad, he's like, man, why are you guys so sad today? What's going on? You know, why, why do you look so dejected, is what my Bible says. This this gives us a look into the heart of Joseph and who he really was. In the midst of his own problems, in the midst of his own disownment, his false accusations of sexual harassment, and his own imprisonment, is that he expresses his concern for somebody else who's going through a difficult time and the problems that they're facing. This just gives us a glimpse into the heart of Jesus also. So if you look, Jesus, while facing his own tribulations in the New Testament, knowing he was to suffer and to die, all the while being tempted by Satan to throw out that plan, he still only showed care and concern for others. Jesus lived his life caring and having compassion for other people, even though he was going through his own problems, on the, having compassion on the, those who came to him in droves and, and wanted to just be close to the man who healed the sick and cast out demons. And so he was tired and he was weary. He suffered worse than any of us could ever imagine. But he found his strength to continue on and fulfill God's plan by relying on his Father in heaven. He never looked on us for pity or to feel sorry for him. Not one time. Jesus never did that. So he only asked each of you, why are you so sad? Why are you so sad? That's what Jesus would say to us. Let me help you. And as Jesus lives his life through each of us as followers of Christ, we should also want to care for the needs of other people. When we see those needs, we should want to be a part of that. The heart of Jesus and the heart of Joseph is an example for all of us to follow. So these two officials, they're sad because their dreams, had, they had these dreams and then they, they don't know what they mean, and even more sad because there's no one in prison to interpret them. So this must have been a heavy, heavy dream. The fact that they weighed so heavy on them tells me that this dream must have come from God because it was, it was weighing on so heavy that they were downcast, they were sad, their faces were dejected. So uh, you know how it is sometimes. We have weird dreams. 
You know, we, we dream stuff, and uh, I dreamed one time I was Scooby-Doo or something because I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was like, row, row, Reggie. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know what I was dreaming. I don't know why I said I just woke up and screamed out Scooby-Doo. Uh, but I don't believe that was a dream from God. I believe it was just, I don't know, maybe he ate some bad pork. Who knows? But when we were at camp this week, we had been fishing during the day, and I dreamed when I was in bed that night that I would cast my pole out, and it would only go out about 10 feet and, go, and stop. And every time I cast, I didn't have enough line. Well, I could sit there and try to make up something all day long that said, well, God, tell me I don't have the resources to reach, whatever, you know. But we don't need to try to make every dream that we have like it comes from God. I do believe that God can speak to us in dreams, but I don't believe that every dream is something he's trying to, to tell you in your life. And so the same would be for, for any of us. So, um, but these things can happen. Uh, we dream stuff sometimes just because we were doing something that day. And so, but these dreams were from God. And so there were many times that God spoke to non-believers. These guys were non-believers. And so they were officials in the king's court. But um, this is not the first time that God spoke to a non-believer. God spoke to a pagan ruler named Abimelech in a dream. Um, what we talked about earlier in Genesis 20, he warned him that Sarah was really Abraham's wife and not his sister, and that would be he would be good as dead if he didn't make things right. So that happened in Genesis 20. So um, God also came to Laban. You remember Laban, Jacob's father-in-law? God came to him in a dream, warned him not to do anything to Jacob. And, and so uh, God uh, came to him. God spoke to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream in Daniel 2.1. And God spoke to Daniel in the book of Daniel. God spoke to Solomon in a dream, uh, in, a dream in, in 1 Kings. God spoke to Pilate's wife in a dream in Matthew 27, 19. And of course, God also came to Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and spoke to them in dreams. So it's not unfamiliar territory for these guys. And Joseph, you know, in this moment is not, he's not, he's not thinking this is just that strange. So uh, Joseph could have easily taken it upon himself when they said, we don't have an interpreter in the prison, and Joseph could have been like, well, you boys are luck. Because I am the official dream interpreter. I mean, I could tell you all day long what this dream means, because guess what? I'm in a position of authority. I've had a dream from God before, and I could tell you what this means. We do take cash, visa, and master cards. If you want, if you want me to pay to interpret your dream. But, oh, you had three grapes in your dream? Yeah, well, that's very possible. Uh, see, those three grapes represent, uh, they represent your family tree. And, and, and your family tree don't have much branches till now. And so those three grapes mean you're going to have three kids. And guess what? It's in the king's cup because they're going to be the kings. So that's it. But he didn't do all that. This wasn't what Joseph said at all. He didn't in no way, in no terms, try to say, well, hey, I know God personally. I, I can, you know, I, I'm going to try to interpret this for you. I told y'all last week that the Lord was with him. And some of y'all might have been like, well, how, did he really know the Lord was with him? I mean, come on. I mean, this, some of this stuff was just like what life dealt him. And it keeps saying the Lord was with him. The Lord blessed him and he was successful. But did he really know that the Lord was with him? This tells me he did. He did know the Lord was with him. And, and so... It, 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 you don't say something like that unless you're certain that the Lord is with you. And what he said was, does not the Lord interpret dreams? It's ain't for me to say, it's for God to say. And I do know God personally, and I have faith that God will speak through me and interpret this dream is what Joseph was saying. So he had to have faith that God led him, that God protected him, elevated him to this place this far, and that God was not going to leave him hanging now in this moment. So he knew that there was nothing his God could not do, and Joseph, Joseph's God was working through him every day of his life, making him prosper, making him successful. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? Absolutely, they do. So uh, verses 10 through 23, we're going to wrap this up as quick as we can. So... Um, and on the, this is a, we actually read all the way through 12. So 12, this is what this dream means, is what Joseph tells me. Joseph said to him, the three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand. 
just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. And so when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread, and the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket of my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast to all of his, for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So, in the dream that Joseph interpreted, interpreted, God used things that might make sense to the butler or the cupbearer. God often speaks to us in, the, in ways that we will understand it and uses things that we will understand. I mean, he was used to, uh, to getting wine ready and serving wine, which meant he was used to grapes and grapevines, so that was something that, that he would could relate to. But if, if I was to try and interpret this dream by myself, I wouldn't have come up with the three days, three grapes, three days thing. I don't, I, there's no telling what I would have came up with. Y'all heard what I came up with in my own mind. But I, would, I just wouldn't have got that. And there was no way Joseph was going to guess this. And guess what? If he's wrong, in three days they're going to know, ain't they? If he's wrong, they're going to know if, if, this is, if this is real or not. So you can bet everybody will be watching and wanting to see what happens. And Joseph says, hey, when this comes true in three days, don't forget about me. You know, the guy who helped you get out, the guy who interpreted your dream and made and made this possible for you. I helped you, you help me, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, that kind of deal. Just put in a good word for me with the king. And that tells you right there that Joseph believed exactly what he just told him. He believed it with all his heart that God had revealed him the truth of that dream. He said, not if you get out, when you get out, don't forget about it. So... So I'm sure by now, after hearing the butler's dream interpretation, the baker is like, ooh, yeah, yeah, ooh, three days, mine's got three in it, yeah, and I got a basket of bread, and this is going to be really cool. I, I'm, I'm excited about what's happening. And so all these, you know, baked goods for Pharaoh, he said, maybe, I'm thinking that maybe in three days, yeah, I'm going to get out these birds. I'm the bread. Yeah, I'm the bread in my dream, and the birds are going to pick me up, and I'm going to be free just like the butler is. And Joseph tells him, so, yeah, you're the bread, all right. You're the bread. And in three days, yeah, those, that means three days, the three does, significant of three days. But in three days, Pharaoh is going to lift off your head and hang you, and the birds will pick your flesh. It's not exactly what he wanted to hear. So Joseph must have understood through God's discernment that justice was being dealt right here between these two guys. And the fate of the, the baker and the butler were each according to justice. So we don't know exactly what crimes they were expected of, but they were heavy crimes. In this case, the butler was innocent, and the baker was guilty. The baker was guilty, the butler was innocent. So those next three days must have been horrible anticipation for him. But here we see how Joseph was a true messenger of God. He was just this faithful servant to deliver the message of judgment. And, and so he was... He was supposed to, to deliver this message of judgment just as much as he was to deliver a message of deliverance. And he did both fully. He didn't lay off anything. He didn't tell him. He didn't try to sugarcoat it and make it feel nice. He said, this is what's going to happen. It wasn't a, a holy, I mean, it wasn't like a, an uplifting interpretation. I mean, he gave it to him with the weight of what it was. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't failed to bring the entire message of God. And this made him a godly messenger. So this is what's wrong in a lot of churches today is that they will gladly preach the cupbearer sermon, but they will not tell the baker sermon. They won't tell the judgment that, that's to come, the hard-nosed truth. And there is truth in both. They're both true, but one is a tad bit harder swallowed than the other. So we don't like how the conviction and the horrible weight of death and destruction make us feel. I get it. We don't like to talk about that stuff, but it's true. And God says we must talk about it. Do you realize that we're either the butler or the baker? You, 
are either the butler or the baker. That's the truth of it. Because of sin, we're all found guilty and we're sentenced to death. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus our Lord. So because Jesus came and offered himself on the cross to die in our place, in your place, in my place, he paid our pardon. He paid the debt that you owe for sin. And he left us the gift, the gift of eternal life and the gift of his Holy Spirit. And because he forgave us of our sins and he died in our place, he died in mine and your place, we are like the butler or the cupbearer. And we are now in communion, we're, we're now in communion with the king. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are now in communion with the king. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, without Jesus, you can do nothing. That's what he said. You can do nothing without Jesus. So we all are known by our fruit, similar to the grapes on the butler's vine in his dream. Fruit is a good thing. John 15, 6 says this, that a branch does not remain in me. When he says the branch does not remain in Jesus, producing fruit, it says when a branch does not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. And listen to this next part. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So if you do not remain in Jesus, such branch, you are like these branches that are thrown into the fire and burned. Without Jesus, we're all guilty. We all deserve death. And unfortunately, if you don't accept Jesus, you will see death. We will all see death, but some of us will receive eternal life in heaven, and others will receive eternal life in hell. Without Jesus, we are guilty, just like the baker, sentenced to die. And if you have never made the decision to ask Jesus to come into your heart and to be Lord of your life, you are sentenced to suffer death also, an eternal death in hell. The Bible says that who, those who live a life loving the world, serving the world, living like the world, forsaking Christ, and living only for themselves will suffer a different eternity. A life without Jesus will end up with you spending an eternity in the lake of fire. And we spent the last few days at youth camp talking about Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to God. This is is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This means that we're no longer to live as the world lives. We're not to accept what the world says is okay. We're not to love the things that the world loves. Yes, we're to love everyone despite what they do or what they believe, even despite how they treat us as Christians, sometimes you're going to be persecuted for your faith. We talked about that this weekend too. But no matter how they treat us, we're not to take part in anything that is not of God. So we do not conform to this world. God has called us to be transformed from a normal person, transformed from who we used to be, so that that old person is dead, dead to sin, and transformed into a servant of God. That servant of God should be willing and able to share why they have the hope that they have in Christ. And that's why these kids wanted to get up in front of you today and tell you why they have the hope that they have in Christ. John 3.18 says that whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, you have a choice to either live your life for the king and accept the deliverance through Jesus, which is symbolic of the butler, or accept, accept the guilty verdict and punishment, much like the baker. You can go to church all you want. You can teach Sunday school all you want. You can go volunteer for every team in the church that you want to all you want. You can give two missions all you want. But if you do all that and you don't have Jesus, then it's all for nothing. You're just going through the motions. It starts with Jesus. Just being a good person will not get you into heaven. You, you cannot earn it. 
God, just being a good person will not save you. Just coming to church does not mean you're saved. You cannot earn salvation no matter how hard you try. You might know Jesus up here in your head, but if you haven't asked him into your heart, it's not real. Even the demons know scripture. Y'all know scripture too, don't you? Well, the demons know it as well, but they don't have Jesus in their heart. They're not giving Jesus control of their life, and that's what changes. God's word changes you. And so, if you don't have him in your heart, and you don't surrender everything to him, then no, nah, it didn't happen. Just didn't happen. It's impossible to come to the presence of our mighty Lord and Savior and remain unchanged. The presence of God changes lives. Being obedient to Christ and doing and living God's will, it changes lives. And if you're still living the way you've always been living and you haven't changed a thing, you're still doing the same old things that you've been doing that you've been trying to break and you ain't been changed, I'm telling you, if you live the way you've always lived and you haven't changed your lifestyle, you are, you are unchanged. Because God changes how you talk, God changes how you love, God changes how you serve, and He changes how you invest in the lives of others. The last verse of chapter 40 says that the butler, when he got out of prison, as Joseph predicted, he did not remember Joseph. And as he asked him to, he asked him to remember. It's like when you get out, man, just remember the guy that interpreted your dream. And it says he forgot. He just plain forgot him. A lot of us have called on Jesus in our lives. We call on him when we're in times of need. And when we're in those times of trial, those dark times of our life, and we go through a rough patch, and then when we got on the other side of it, guess what? He forgot about Jesus. Because you got through it. You got through what you were going through, and that's all that mattered. You really needed his help, and you prayed for it, and you really did. You needed it, but as soon as you got on the other side of it, you forgot him. If you were in prison waiting for your death and then God set you free, you don't forget that. You don't forget that. When Jesus really gets a hold of your life and you surrender everything, you don't forget that. When God steps in and reveals himself to you and he forgives all the bad that you've ever done in your entire life and your chains are broken, you don't forget that. You don't forget a deliverance like that. And when God came down to this earth setting aside his kingship as Lord and Savior in heaven and made himself man on earth and came to this cross and was beaten and spit upon and suffered and died a death on the cross, you don't forget that. And when he said that he would raise, he'd be raised from the dead three days later, you know what, if he was wrong, he'd have been proven wrong. But they, he was not wrong. He prophesied that he would raise, be raised from the dead three days later, and he was. And because of that, I have a Savior in heaven who's preparing a place for me that I can go and experience eternal life. Because God's word is truth. Today's the day to remember and forget no more. Allow Jesus to come into your life and deliver you from your chains of bondage. Who are you? Are you the butler or the baker? Do you want deliverance or do you want death? The choice is yours. Will you bow your heads? Today you have a choice to make. We see these students have surrendered all that they are come before a holy and mighty God who gave his life for you. They are setting the tone for today's service by their servanthood. And they are setting the tone for the next phase of their life. Are you willing to surrender and follow and do what they have done and allow God to change you? To make you who he desired you to be? Are you willing to surrender everything and realize that you need a family that you need people who will stand behind you, support you, and encourage you. Today, you have that opportunity. Today, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, it's as easy as admitting that you're a sinner, believing that God is the Savior of the world, that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, and he rose from the dead three days later, and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you want him to be Lord over your life. Today, you can have that opportunity. 
Father, we come to you now. We just pray you bless our time of invitation. I pray that you would allow your spirit to move freely in this place, God. I know that you are here. I know that you're working in the lives of these people as you're working in the lives of these students, Lord. And I pray for people to respond, whether it be coming to the altar in prayer just to, to lay things at your feet that we came in here, Lord. We came in here with baggage. We don't need to leave here with it. We need to lay it at your feet, the only person who can help us through it, who can help us carry it. And God, I pray today you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand?